Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another case. Today's case is, well, you can decide for yourself whether you believe it is solved or not. For all intensive purposes, however, it is. But it's certainly a case with a lot of mystery and conspiracy surrounding it. Now this case is a bit of a different one. You'll understand why as I get into it. And this is also one of those cases that I can clearly remember being splashed across the media when I was a child back when it first happened. And how much this case scared the living daylights out of me. Not because it involved scary people or bad people or whatever else scared me when I was a child. It's because it involved one of my personal biggest fears. And that is open water. I cannot even explain to you how I personally feel when I think about the open water. You won't ever catch me more than a foot deep in the sea at the beach, scuba diving, traveling on a boat or a ship, nothing like that. But you will catch me shooting across the country at 700 kilometers an hour in a confined metal tube. So go figure. <laughs> anyway, I was actually binge watching uh, a show or the show I Shouldn't Be Alive on YouTube really recently and a few of the episodes revolved, well, people being lost at sea, open water. And that's when I remembered today's case. The details of this case are also probably going to make you very mad. So much had to go wrong for this tragedy to happen. So many mistakes, so many oversights. And this case was also the inspiration for the movie Open Water, although not based on what happened exactly. So let's get into really what did happen in today's case. So we are heading back to January of 1998 to Sunny Cairns in Queensland, Australia. American couple Thomas Joseph Lonergan, 33, and Eileen Cassidy Lonergan, born Eileen Hain, 28, had just finished up a three-year tour of duty with the US Peace Corps. They spent the first two of these three years in the island country of Tuvalu in its capital of Funafuti as teachers. And in the third year, Thomas or Tom as he was often called and Eileen lived in Fiji teaching at a Methodist school for young underprivileged children. Now, if you're like me and you have never heard of Tuvalu or Funafuti before, or maybe my geography is just a little bit rubbish, which it definitely is. I'll have a map on the screen for you now. But basically Tuvalu is a tiny South Pacific island nation with a population of just over 11,000 situated about halfway between Australia and Hawaii. And Funafuti is an atoll. And an atoll is, according to Oxford and Languages, a ring-shaped reef, island, or chain of islands formed of coral. You learn something new every single day, don't you? <laughs> anyway, after finishing up with the Peace Corps, Tom and Eileen, and yes, before anyone comments, I know their names sound like, come on Eileen. So uh, moving past that, they decided they were going to make the most of being abroad and do a little bit of a round the world trip before heading back home to where they were from, which was Baton Rouge in Louisiana. So Indonesia and Paris were next on their travel list, but first they decided to start with Queensland, Australia. The couple were fans of diving and were both experienced divers as well. So they decided that this would be the perfect opportunity to go diving in Australia. Australia's world famous Great Barrier Reef. And if you've somehow missed the memo on why the reef is so special, it's one of the world's largest coral reef systems, making up about 10% of the world's coral reef systems, and it's the only living organism that can be seen from space, which is pretty damn cool if you ask me. It's also one of the seven natural wonders of the world. However, these days, the Great Barrier Reef is in a little bit of trouble. I'm certainly not going to sit here and pretend to be the expert on it because realistically I know very little but from what I do understand the reef is dying due to a variety of reasons from what I understood from my research including coral bleaching, water quality, climate change, pollution, just to name a few which is incredibly sad. And somehow this video has turned into a history lesson but I do think it is very interesting what is happening with the reef and as I said very very sad it's 
worth doing your own research on it, I feel. But anyway, back to Tom and Eileen. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of who the couple were before we get into their Australian trip. Tom and Eileen met at the Louisiana State University where they were both students and this is where Eileen took up scuba diving. A hobby she eventually convinced Tom to also join her in and a hobby they both fell in love with and would continue to do for years to come. The couple bonded over many things including their love for adventure and helping others and by mid-1988 Tom and Eileen were married. They joined the US Peace Corps in the early 1990s and were, as I said, on a tour of duty right up until about 1997, where they were both teachers. But by this point, the couple were really, really over teaching. In fact, Eileen wrote in her diary that she hated teaching. And speaking of her diary, the couple actually both kept a diary, but I'm going to get back to that a little bit later on. So let's skip forward to their Aussie trip. Tom and Eileen arrived in Cairns, Australia, in January or mid-January of 1998 and for those unaware Cairns is just north of Queensland and in January in Cairns the weather is very hot humid basically tropical weather and it's also monsoon season so Sunday January 25 was dive day and the weather could not have been any better for it. It was also one day before Australia Day. So early that morning, the couple were picked up by a shuttle bus from their hostel, which was called the Walkabout Hostel, and taken to a marina in Port Douglas. And for those that don't know, Port Douglas is, I guess, kind of like a tropical beach resort town thing about one hour from Cairns. I've never been to these places myself, so a lot of this is just me googling and researching and learning if I seem a little lost. <laughs> and that same shuttle bus was scheduled to pick the couple up that afternoon and take them back to the hostel after their dive. At around 8.30 a.m., Tom, Eileen, and 24 other members of a tour group, plus five crew members, got on a dive charter boat with a dive company called Outer Edge. The dive, which was $160 Australian per head, would consist of visiting three separate dive spots located on the rim of the Great Barrier Reef, and it will conclude at about mid-afternoon. The dive spots were roughly 62 kilometres or 40 miles from the shore of Port Douglas. The group's last dive was at a coral formation known as Fish City, located somewhere between the St. Crispin Reef and the Agincourt Reefs. And this dive, like the others, was set to last roughly 40 minutes in length. There was a little bit of conflicting information as to exactly where Fish City was, by the way, but it does look like it was somewhere between the, as I said, the St. Crispin Reef and the Agincourt Reefs. So I'm sorry if I've gotten that piece of information incorrect if you are like an avid diver or really familiar with the Great Barrier Reef. So, although all three dives had been set at about 40 minutes that day, Tom and Eileen had actually surfaced about 10 to 15 minutes late from the previous two dives, likely losing track of the time and getting lost in exploring. But either way, this did set the tour group's schedule back a little bit. So the way the dives worked was that a crew member, referred to as the dive master, would conduct a guided tour of the reef. But because Tom and Eileen were experienced divers, they decided they would conduct their own dive of Fish City on their own terms. They did also inform the Outer Edge tour group of this decision, by the way. They didn't just decide to disappear and go off on their own dive. And something else interesting to note was that Tom and Eileen were wearing pretty intensive diving suits for that day. According to the crew, they both had on five millimeter thick wetsuits, gloves, plus diving hoods. And this was apparently the type of gear that was appropriate for colder waters, not the warm tropical waters of Cairns. If there's any diving experts watching though, please correct me on anything down below or maybe explain this to me because I couldn't find any explanation as to why they would be wearing such intensive gear. And just like the last two dives, the couple got a little bit carried away with the time and surfaced a little later than the stipulated 40 minutes. But we can only assume what happened next. It's likely that Tom and Eileen resurfaced maybe 10 or 15 minutes late, looked around and realized that their boat was gone 
all very far into the distance. By the way, it's literally pouring with rain here, so if you can hear that, I'm really sorry. Meanwhile, on the dive boat, the crew had just finished up doing the mandatory head count. They counted 26 on board, the number of divers that they begun with, and with that, they headed back to Port Douglas. However, unbeknownst to the crew, oh, we have company, we have company. You haven't been in the video for a long time, have you? Are you gonna sit? Are you gonna sit? There may be a tail in the screen for a couple of minutes, so let's just, let's just ignore that. <laughs> so as I was saying, unbeknownst to the crew, mid counting, two of the divers had actually jumped back in the water, meaning the head count came up short. But it only came up short by two, not four. The two that dived back in the water had already been accounted for. So when they got back on the boat, the confused crew assumed that their head count was now correct and confirmed 26 divers with the captain or the skipper and off they went, leaving Tom and Eileen stranded in the water, miles and miles from the closest shore. After the diving boat arrived back on shore and disembarked, a crew member from Outer Edge discovered that someone from the tour group had left behind their bag and some shoes. Assuming the owners would be back soon to collect their items, they turned them into lost property without giving it too much thought. But if anyone had bothered to go through the bag that day to look for ID, they would have pretty quickly realised that the people who owned the lost property had not made it back to shore with the rest of the group. So let's call this piece of information clue number one, the lost property items. That same afternoon, the Outer Edge Diving Company received a call from the shuttle bus service that had been scheduled to pick up Tom and Eileen from the marina in Port Douglas and take them back to their hostel. The shuttle bus driver informed them that Tom and Eileen had not shown up for their scheduled pickup and asked Outer Edge if they knew where the couple may have gone. The bus driver had even hopped off the bus and had a quick look around for them before phoning the diving company. Outer Edge suggested that maybe Tom and Eileen had decided to make their own way back that day and with that both parties put the couple out of their minds and continued on with their day. So let's call this clue at number two, the shuttle bus. And as it turned out Tom and Eileen never even made it back to their hostel that night and the Outer Edge Diving Company would have known this had they looked in the bag left behind that day because in this bag were Tom and Eileen's passports and Tom's wallet. And had they phoned the couple's contact number, the Walkabout Hostel, to inform them that Tom and Eileen's lost property was there, they would have discovered that the couple were missing. But tonight falls on January 25 and no one catches on to the fact that two tourists are stranded out in the middle of the water. So and now it's the next day, Monday, January 26, Australia Day, and as they do every day, the Outer Edge Diving Company are loading up another tour group of divers. And one of the divers that day makes a very interesting discovery. They discover six diving weights abandoned at the bottom of the ocean floor. And diving weights, by the way, are basically like little weights uh, that divers wear to counteract the equipment that they're wearing that would make them float to the surface. So one may remove their diving weights if they were trying to, say, stay afloat, for example, for some reason. Anyway, the diver shows Outer Edge their little discovery and the crew tells them to consider it a bonus find and that's that on that really. Again, nothing clicks with any of the crew members. And we can call this clue number three, the diving weights. The next day, Tuesday, January 27, Outer Edge skipper Jack Nen, I think it's pronounced, who had been the skipper on Tom and Eileen's boat as well, noticed that the same bag and shoes had been sitting in the lost property now for two days. So he decides to have a look in the bag for some ID. He finds a passport belonging to an American couple, Tom and Eileen Lonigan. Jack looks up their contact details at the walkabout hostel and gives them a call to inform them that they need to come down and collect their stuff. But what the hostel tells Jack 
makes his blood run cold. The couple never returned from their diving trip two days previous and had not been seen since. Suddenly the lost property, the shuttle bus and the diving weights all click and alarm bells start going off. By the way, my cat is still down here. If you can see my hand like scritch, scritch, scritching, just trying to pat her and keep her um, happy. <laughs> Tom and Eileen are finally reported missing to the police both at last seen diving in the Great Barrier Reef, miles and miles from shore, 48 hours previous. An air and sea search immediately begins for the couple, but after two full days in the ocean, surrounded by tiger sharks amongst other deadly creatures, the chances of them still being out there alive is pretty low. Over time, the search for the couple is called off, but a search for clues as to exactly what happened to them continues for many, many more months. So this brings us to discussing exactly what happened to Tom and Eileen Lonergan. We of course do know up until a certain point what happened to them. And I think anyone that has seen the film Open Water may have assumed that the couple were eaten by sharks. An open and shut case, right? But it's not quite that simple. And by the way, if you are, like me, terrified of sharks and the open water, don't watch the film like I did. <laughs> that aside, it is a good movie if you forget about the fact that it is based loosely on, on true and horrifying events. Also quite interesting, although somewhat irrelevant to today's case, is that the movie Open Water was actually filmed in open water. The actors spent roughly 120 hours in the water, 20 miles off Barbados wearing chainmail under their wetsuits to protect them from the actual sharks that were lurking in the waters. They did have shark experts on the set, so I'm sure the actors were relatively safe, but I'm guessing the look of fear on the actors' faces was pretty legit. Points for authenticity, right? Maybe, I guess. A little too chillingly authentic, maybe, for my liking. But as you can imagine, the diving industry, nor the families of Tom and Eileen, were too happy about the release of this movie particularly as the low-budget movie was a surprise success. Eileen's father, John Haynes, stated regarding the movie, quote, As far as the movie is concerned, we're not interested in seeing it. We won't see it, end quote. So getting a bit off track there talking about the movie. So after Tom and Eileen's disappearance, theories started to swirl as to exactly what happened to the couple. Some of these theories are ridiculous and some of them are more reasonable. So let's go through a few of them now and also go over all of the items belonging to Tom and Eileen that eventually washed up on shore. About one month after their disappearance, a woman's wetsuit that was roughly the same size as Eileen's washed up on a beach in North Queensland. It had a few minor tears in it, but after an examination, it revealed that these tears were simply a result of brushing up against sharp coral. And an examination of the barnacle growth on the wetsuit's zipper confirmed that the wetsuit had been floating around the ocean for roughly one month, which would, of course, line up with the couple's disappearance, and the wetsuit was actually in pretty good condition for how long it had been out in the ocean. I don't believe the wetsuit was ever actually 100% confirmed to be Eileen's, though. Not long after this discovery, some of Tom and Eileen's diving gear washed up on the shores of a remote beach in Port Douglas. Included in this find were diving vests with the couple's name written on it, their air tanks still filled with a little bit of air, plus one of Eileen's diving fins or flippers. One of the reasons I don't have my cat in here to film is, um, do you see how much hair she sheds? Can you see that? It's going everywhere, it's getting on my face, it's getting up my nose, in my mouth. Hopefully you can't see it floating around the screen, but uh, if you can, just ignore it. So this gear that was found indicated that the couple had not been attacked by a shark, at least not while wearing their gear, as it was found in relatively good nick. But this does lead us to another idea or theory. Would the Lonigans have removed their wetsuits or diving gear, the very gear that was keeping them afloat in the water? 
And if they did, why? Surely they would have realized that as soon as they removed their equipment, their survival time would have been limited by how long they could tread water or swim. And this leads some people to believe that perhaps the couple removed their gear in an attempt to swim to shore. Maybe scuba gear or wetsuits are good for swimming underwater, but maybe not so good for, say, doing miles and miles of breaststroke back to the shore in the ocean. If anyone watching this again happens to be a diver, let me know your thoughts on this. Another theory regarding why they may have removed their wetsuits or diving gear relates to dehydration. Perhaps the couple became delirious and disorientated, and as a result of dehydration, it led them to removing everything they had on them. I did see a few mentions of hypothermia, but this idea somewhat confused me. Given the warm weather of Cairns in late January, having said that, I'm not sure how cold the ocean may get overnight, especially if you had been floating in it for hours and hours, it may get much colder than I imagine. And of course, one of the side effects of hypothermia is, ironically, that you feel hot and you remove all of your clothing. Could this have possibly happened to the Lonigans? So circling back to the idea that they may have attempted to swim to shore, which in my opinion seems pretty logical. If you look at a map where Tom and Eileen were abandoned on the reef, the nearest land is a place called Cape Tribulation. And that is about 40 k's or 25 miles away. And she is gone. I know for myself, as someone that is a very weak swimmer, I can barely do 50 meters in a pool. But for a young fit couple that are experienced divers, would this distance have been achievable? It may not have been, but if it was life or death, wouldn't you at least give it a go? We do also, of course, have to take into account the fact that ocean water is never perfectly still even when it may look like it's sitting still to us from a boat or on land. And then there is also the current. So this swim may have ended up being a losing battle for them. And of course, there is the chance that Tom and Eileen did make a swim for it, but drowned or were eaten by sharks before they made it to shore. So about one week after their disappearance, investigators learned that a fishing boat had been anchored out at the St. Crispin Reef where Tom and Eileen had been diving on the night of their disappearance. The boat, whose occupants were actually out having a bit of a party that night, sat at idle on the reef until about midnight with its lights on. Which begs the question, why didn't Tom and Eileen swim out to the boat to be rescued? My personal theory on this was that the current had long since carried them in a completely opposite direction. If you can't tell by now, I don't know much about the ocean and currents, things like that. This is just my thought, theory, opinion, idea. Those on the fishing boat also claim that it was a perfectly still night and experts have said that the couple should have at least seen the lights of the boat or heard the vibrations of the boat's motor humming at idol. But as I said, I don't think they were anywhere near the boat by this time. And the idea of water being perfectly still when you're sitting in a boat is totally different to if you're stranded in the water in your scuba gear. Also from what I understand, the boat got there in the evening. And since Tom and Eileen were abandoned at around 3pm, this was plenty of time for the current to drag them far, far away. So Eileen's father, John Haynes, decided to do a little bit of an experiment to see exactly what it would be like to be left abandoned in the ocean, as his daughter and son-in-law had, and maybe even find some clues as to what had happened to them. He went diving at the exact same spot that Tom and Eileen had been in, the Agincourt Reefs and St. Crispin Reefs area, and quickly learned a few things about what they had experienced. He noted that at the level the couple would have been bobbling at in the water would have not given them much of a clear vision of what was around them. 
So nearby where the couple were left behind, there were a few things that may or may not have saved their lives. One of these was a large lifesaver ring that they could have grabbed onto, but even more helpful, over in the Agincourt reefs was a pontoon called the Quicksilver Pontoon. I'll pop a map up on the screen for you and some images to give you a better visual of the pontoon. John Haynes also does not believe that the couple would have made any kind of attempt to swim to shore because Tom and Eileen more than likely believed that the Outer Edge dive boat would be back to rescue them at any minute. And when you're lost, isn't the general advice that you stay put? Haynes also believed that their lack of clear vision ahead coupled with the fact that they would have been fighting against the current means they would have stayed put where they were left. And of course, this means that the current would have naturally pulled them in another direction. Eileen's father's final conclusion is a pretty simple one. He believes Tom and Eileen became dehydrated, disorientated and either drowned or were taken by sharks. So let's move on to some more of the out there theories. The first being that Tom and Eileen in fact planned out this entire scenario in an effort to disappear, start a new life together and be presumed dead. Some theories I read even suggested that the pair were CIA agents and the whole Peace Corps thing had been their cover. And a small few even believed that the couple had been abducted by aliens. But I am not even going to start going down that rabbit hole. Anyway, as we do know, yes, Tom and Eileen did stay out past their allocated dive time of 40 minutes. But in order for this plan to work, they would have somehow had to have planned for the diving company to do an incorrect head count and for them to not have paid any attention to all the clues I mentioned earlier, the lost property, the shuttle bus, and the diving weights. Even if Tom and Eileen had heard the boat's motor start up that day, they may have been many, many feet underwater and surely it would have taken them time to resurface. And by that point, the boat would have been on its way. To add fuel to the fire of this theory, the skipper of another dive boat in the Port Douglas area made a pretty startling claim. He says the day after Tom and Eileen's disappearance, he took a dive group of Italian tourists out to the Agincourt reefs and as is procedure, he did a head count before leaving. But he claims when he redid the head count coming back into shore, there were two extra people on board. On top of that, the skipper claims he heard American accents amongst the Italian tourists. And to add even more fuel to this fire, there have been actually dozens of sightings of the Lonigans across Australia. But when it comes down to it, how much of any of this proves anything? Any good true crime junkie knows how unreliable witness sightings can be. And if you don't, watch The Innocence Files on Netflix. A few of their episodes focus on witness sightings and just how inaccurate they can be and how much they can ruin people's lives for that matter. Also, Tom and Eileen left behind every single item they owned and their bank accounts have remained untouched, making running away, especially from the middle of the ocean, pretty difficult. Now let's discuss the diary entries that I mentioned earlier and how these entries led investigators to some more sinister theories as to what happened to Tom and Eileen. A journal entry from Tom dated August 3rd 1997 states, like a student who has finished an exam I feel like my life is complete and I am ready to die. As far as I can tell from here my life can only get worse. It has peaked and it's all downhill from here until my funeral. Then the following year on January 9, 1998, Eileen writes in her diary an entry that somewhat relates to Tom's entry, stating, Tom hopes to die a quick and painless death and he hopes it happens soon. Tom is not suicidal, but he's got a death wish that could lead him to what he desires and I could get caught in that. Now, you can analyse and interpret these entries however you would like, but to me, Tom sounds depressed. 
I'm not a professional and I'm not saying that he was, but when you're down and you're depressed, you say and do things that you don't necessarily mean. You may even take the silly risks that endangers your life or others. And let's not forget what they went through was neither quick nor painless. Tom's entry was referred to as a death wish by some, leading people to believe that the couple's life may have ended due to a murder-suicide or a suicide pact, which quite frankly doesn't make any sense because according to friends and family of Eileen's, she loved her life and she was afraid to die. As I said, we can interpret these very short excerpts from their diaries as we wish, but we really have no way of reading what was on their minds and truly understanding how they were feeling at the time. As someone that used to be an avid diary writer and definitely had the odd dark and depressing entry, I probably made some passing comments myself that when taken out of context would have made me sound like I was a danger or depressed or I wanted to die, when in fact that was never true at all. Tom and Eileen had also been making future plans for themselves. They had prepaid for their future travel plans and Tom had re-enrolled in university. Not exactly things you do when you're planning to disappear or take your own life. Six months after the disappearance of the Lomigans, another piece of evidence washed up on shore and this was potentially the most interesting, telling and haunting clue yet. A dive slate was found by fishermen caught up in some mangrove in some very crocodile infested waters not to mention at a place called Archers Point in Cooktown which is about 175 k's or 108 miles north of Port Douglas. And a dive slate by the way is basically a slate or a board that you can write on underwater. The fishermen retrieved the battered dive slate from the waters and saw that it had a message on it. The message read, Monday, January 26, 1998, 8am. To anyone that can help us, we have been abandoned on the Agincourt Reef, 25 Jan 1998, 3pm. Please help us, come to rescue us before we die. Help. Now there's definitely been some debate as to whether this piece of evidence is genuine or not. And even in my research, I couldn't find a definitive answer. Most sources seem to point towards it being legitimate though. And if that is the case, then this dive slate does confirm that the Alonigans at least made it through the night and into the following morning. Unfortunately for Tom and Eileen though, the search did not start for them until the next day. So after speaking about all of the oversights and the stuff ups, you may be wondering, was anyone actually held accountable for what happened to Tom and Eileen? And the answer is yes, kind of. The outrage skipper on Tom and Eileen's dive boat that day, Jack Nan, was charged with manslaughter, but due to the fact that realistically the incident was not one person's fault and one person couldn't be held accountable, Jack Nan was acquitted of all charges. The rest of the crew on board were never charged with anything either. The jury may have also been swayed by the fact that it was argued in court that the couple may still be alive out there somewhere or that they took their own lives. Theories that both Tom and Eileen's family strongly disagree with. The Outer Edge Diving Company did go out of business after this, unsurprisingly, but it was mostly due to the fact that they received a large fine for breaching health and safety rules. But I'm sure that it was also due to the fact that the diving industry as a whole was really hurting after this tragedy occurred. And personally, I really don't feel like this fine was enough justice for Tom and Eileen. But again, who exactly do you pin the blame on? You'll have to let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts on this are. The Queensland government also went on to introduce tougher diving industry regulations, but despite this, a similar incident would occur just two years later. In January of 2000, a diver named Paul Lucas 
was left behind by a diving company and spent a terrifying 40 hours at sea. But he was lucky enough to be rescued. This did actually happen in New South Wales, by the way, not in Queensland, but you would really think that the entire country as a whole would have toughened up their diving industry regulations at least in an effort to heal the industry. In the end, what happened to Tom and Eileen was a tragic accident, but I just personally can't get past the fact that the company took two full days to realise their mistake. I, it, it, it blows my mind, honestly. But anyway, let me know your thoughts down below. Let me know what your theories are on today's case. I would love to hear what you have to say. And as always, thank you for being here and listening to Tom and Eileen's story. And thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are all absolute stars. Um, follow me on Instagram. It's uh, at underscore Samantha Melanie with no E on the end. Like, comment, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye, guys.